Our next speaker is Dr. John, John Carrier. While he is in his 13th year as a senior lecturer at the Sloan School of Management, John did his PhD work in the School of Engineering. So he has the perspective of both, both sides of the campus. He greatly uh, appreciates the opportunity to work with, MI, uh, work with MIT IOP and its member companies. His particular specialty is in system dynamics and control, which is of special relevance today as we enter the digital transformation. John has ex extensive experience working in industry as well, including automotive, chemicals, oil and gas, food and beverage, and also high tech. Let's welcome John. Thank you very much, Graham. And uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for, for joining today for this uh, today's talk. So as uh, Graham pointed out, my name is uh, uh, John Carrier, and I'm a senior lecturer here at the Sloan School. And uh, my, although I'm a chemical engineer, my background is really uh, in control systems. And one of the things I've learned in life is everything must be kept flowing. So uh, again, I'm a senior lecturer in the System Dynamics Group. I have degrees in engineering, in chemical engineering and control but I spend about 70% of my time uh, actually in operations out on factory floors, uh, making improvements in both the process and discrete manufacturing. And in the past five years, I've been dealing even more with uh, digital information because one of the things I've, I was shocked to learn is uh, in high school physics, we learned that electrons move at the speed of light. Uh, I find electrons actually move much slower than physical parts and anyone who's ever tried to get an invoice know that that's true. So on one hand, we have all this great technology uh, in terms for digital transformation, uh, but the real challenge is um, our, our system's currently ready to absorb it. And we're now in the point where a crisis has actually opened that up for our new mindset. And uh, I also, uh, offer a course here out of the MIT Sloan Executive Education on Industry 4.0. Uh, this June 11th and 12th, we'll be doing it live online, where we work, work with companies to help them understand their current systems better, so they match the technology to the system, rather than match their system to the technology. Um, I've also written uh, several articles, and here's a few interesting ones, is uh, for those of you who are movie fans and interested in uh, automotive racing in uh, F1 and Le Mans, you can uh, uh, see the uh, article I wrote on Ford versus Ferrari from the perspective of a systems thinker. Uh, that was written for MIT Sloan, but that article was picked up by Industry Week. So I think it has a lot of good lessons on taking a system lens to your company and how to use digital technology uh, to help you transform. And then finally, uh, an article in Sloan Management Review on the most underrated skill in management that I uh, uh, produced with my colleagues at the Sloan School. And key to the whole uh, endeavor is really understanding what problem we're trying to solve. And my focus on this article is how do we actually scope down so that we solve the next problem in the right sequence? So uh, that's been a very popular article. It was one of the most popular articles in Sloan in uh, 2018. And I think you'll get uh, some great uh, uh, value out of that too. So where we're actually at in this point in time is we're suffering through a pandemic and uh, it's dealt a major demand shock to our system. And if you look at the uh, graph on the left, uh, US GDP, and this is uh, uh, relatively true for the rest of the world, has been a uh, very stable growth for the past 10 years, now encumbered by this shock. And our challenge is our current supply chains have optimized for stable growth. And our real concern is how are our supply chains going to respond and recover from this shock? So I wanna step back and take a, uh, uh, an analogy from nature. And here, uh, we're actually gonna step into space and uh, we're gonna look at optimization as laziness. So if you think how nature optimizes, and nature is always optimizing, it does it using this law of least action. And what does that mean? Well, let's think about our astronauts in space that we see in this photograph on the left. 
uh, for these astronauts in space, they lose approximately 1% of muscle mass per day in their legs. And uh, they also simulated uh, nerve loss by uh, uh, mobilizing mice legs who lost 70% of their nerve cells after 28 days of disuse. And uh, the key here is uh, who's, who's at fault for this, right? Are the people at fault for this or is it the system they're in? And uh, these people are behaving logically. They're trying to optimize. But if our system changes, we may have optimized for the last system and not the system that's going forward. And so our responsibility as leaders is to make sure that we uh, stimulate our system through uh, uh, fire drills, through simulations, through scenario analyses, so that optimization doesn't turn into laziness. Okay, now let's uh, take that example and go back to the world of business. And uh, if you're going to consider uh, some of the finest optimized supply chains, uh, one would go back to Henry Ford's Model T. And uh, Henry Ford's team did not create the assembly line for the Model T. That had been in existence for a long time. His team invented the moving assembly line. The uh, uh, assembly line was actually put on motors and it moved at a constant speed. So um, when they put it on this moving assembly line, defects became very apparent. And over approximately 15 years, uh, Henry Ford and his team was able to reduce the cost of that Model T by a factor of four, while quality and improved performance actually improved, which sounds fantastic. However, uh, after about 15 years, there was a sharp change in customer demand. And I wanna blow up that piece of the curve. So uh, in 1927, um, Henry Ford had to shut down the entire Ford Rouge and they made no cars for six months as they retooled for the Model A. And uh, by the way, I think you can guess who the competitor was that introduced new uh, models that changed customer demand. It was of course, Alfred P. Sloan uh, uh, of GM, who uh, was of course uh, the uh, progenitor of uh, the Sloan management. So the issue here is the more we optimize, at some point we actually make our system very sensitive to shocks. So we are now moving away from a period of optimization and back into adaptation. And uh, let's take this uh, forward to a more recent crisis. Uh, back around 2009, 2010, uh, gasoline prices sparked to $4 a gallon, right? And I wanna tell you the tale of two supply chains and compare Toyotas to GMs. So uh, both companies have a relentless push on productivity to drive costs down to make profits. But unfortunately, as you can see with the formula on the left, this can actually lead uh, to increases in inventory and lead time if you're not careful, right? And in 2009, uh, neither Toyota nor GM predicted this massive shock in, in uh, energy price, but uh, Toyota was caught with 30 days of inventory of Priuses and General Motors was caught with 150 days of inventory of Hummers. So the real question is, um, if you're looking at this impending shock, where is your current supply chain and what do we need to do differently to make sure we keep our inventory and lead time down so that we actually have an adaptable system when an unpredictable shock occurs. And clearly we're going through a challenge uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, but we're actually going through three challenges at the same time. And I'd like to uh, enunciate those here. Uh, first, we need to recover from the internal demand, external demand shock from the COVID-19. And second, this external shock is actually identifying weak spots in our current supply chains and where we need to rebuild our capability. And third, we also have the challenge where as we make this recovery, uh, instead of making short-term patches, we need to understand how to incorporate the new technologies provided to us by Industry 4.0 so that going forward, our supply chains have greater transparency, resiliency, and response time. And 
I would like to show you the graph on the left, uh, which is the classic uh, iceberg model uh, that many of us have seen who've worked in business. And the general uh, message it tries to show us is the explicit parts of any organization and supply chain that we actually see. Uh, these are the artifacts such as data and information, documentations, records, and files. That's only about 5% of what's going on. And 95% of what's going on in our organizations and supply chains is actually hidden. It's in people's minds, it's an experience, it's hidden in inventory, uh, and it's stuck in dead time. And it depends on people's a specific knowledge of a situation that isn't known by the entire organization. And uh, one of the challenging things about crises, they tend to expose this tacit knowledge. So what I'd like to do now is open up our first poll and uh, uh, ask you around supply chain visibility. So on a scale of one to 10, where would you rate your firm on supply chain visibility and transparency? And I'll take some time to take that uh, 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 poll. Okay, we have our, our poll results back. And essentially what we're seeing here is a relatively uh, wide range of, uh, of visibility into our supply chains. And uh, we actually have a peak of around uh, the highest numbers around 24%, but ultimately uh, we'd say we're between about three and seven, okay? Why don't we take a look at what some of the experts uh, say. And this is a uh, article from Sloan Management Review uh, uh, entitled, What's Keeping Supply Chain Executives Up at Night? And let's see where they rated their own supply chains. And uh, Te Tejado Donde of Sinopolis rated his supply chain uh, five to 10. And his quotation was, in today's volatile environment, speed and agility are equally or more important than cost. And that really relates back to what we discussed in the previous slide. We spent the last 10 years optimizing our supply chains for cost. And now we're learning we have to uh, get speed and agility back. Uh, Jeremy Cram from Micro Center, uh, he also rated his supply chain vis visibility at five to 10. And he said, it's difficult for us to track inbound shipments across the broad array of carriers used by our vendors. And it's difficult to easily track freight from coming overseas. So even within your organization, you're very sensitive to what your supply chain partners are doing. And uh, this is summed up very well by the quote from David Anderson of Supply Chain Ventures. Transparency is a huge issue for companies wanting to operate responsible supply chains because they're filled with these black holes and being able to see down the global supply chains beyond the first tier suppliers is really a problem. I just, uh, we have one problem with COVID-19 and now we're actually, uh, I gave you three things we need to work on. But there actually is a silver lining in this, especially around technology. So um, uh, one issue that we've witnessed over the past 10 years is technologies and technology companies have been investing in new technologies faster than companies have been able to buy it, right? And we can see this on the graph of the left, which is Gartner's classic hype cycle on emerging technologies. And this graph is for 2018. Um, the graph from 2019 has such advanced technologies, it's actually not relevant yet. But if you look at this graph, you're seeing things like uh, digital twins in 2018, we're at the peak of the hype cycle, and we're just starting to get into where uh, things like augmented reality are being useful. So uh, two points here. One, we can actually take advantage of this because uh, as companies now in our crisis, we can leverage off these massive technology investments other companies, including startups, have made, and we can start investing on a trial or subscription basis. And second, uh, we can also start to explain why we see this sharp dip from the uh, peak of inflated expectations through the trough of disillusionment. This is when you actually go to match the technologies to your actual system. Well, now we're under so much pressure, uh, that pain will help us through that trough of disillusionment because uh, we need to adopt this new technology if we wanna come out the other side, a much stronger organization. And another difference about this technological uh, revolution versus previous ones is, uh, 
this is being referred to as uh, uh, Patrick Kennedy of president of OSISoft is calling it a zero capital revolution. And what he means by that is the first three industrial revolutions, whether we were buying massive physical equipment or even investing in expensive ERP systems, we had to put a great deal of capital up front and then see the results in 12 to 18 months. Now, uh, given this global digital backbone we have th through the cloud and uh, access to sophisticated analytics, is we can start using these new technologies with virtually no capital investment at all, which if we understand how to do that, is gonna be a tremendous advantage for our recovery. So what are we really trying to buy when we're trying to uh, purchase technology to help us out of this crisis? And if you look at how any system behaves, is there's really two time constants. And uh, by the way, I am uh, very familiar with Laplace transform. So if anyone wants an extra session on Laplace transforms after my talk, I'm very happy to do it. But for most of us, uh, I will speak in very uh, uh, understandable uh, concrete concepts. And how do I know a system is good or it's, it's capable? I only need to know one property. And that is, is the time for my system to respond less or greater than the time to the consequence from the external environment, which may be a customer or it may be a, a crisis. So for instance, think of a fire drill. Um, if the building catches on fire, it was designed to basically protect people and assets for three to five minutes. Do we have enough time to respond to get the people out of the building and the fire department in place uh, before the consequences result. With customers, this means if the customer places a demand for an order, can we respond quickly enough before they go find someone else? And time is really a system property. And the challenge is companies are organized functionally. So if I need to find five minutes to serve a customer better, it's not always clear in the company where I need to go even if that five minutes could be worth $10,000 a minute as it is in many large production facilities. And with this point, um, I'd really like to uh, uh, demonstrate this concept with three terrific uh, quotations. First is uh, from Theodore Levitt, and his quote is classic quote on marketing is people don't want to buy a quarter inch drill. They want to buy a quarter inch hole in the wall. The challenge is companies don't sell holes in the wall. If you go to the hardware store, they sell drills. So understanding what your customer needs and as a customer, what you're really trying to buy is critical. Second, uh, and this is a great quote from Randy Paulsch of the, uh, in his book, The Last Lecture, Professor from Carnegie Mellon, doing something at the last minute is much more expensive than before the last minute. So here is where that uh, elusive ROI for many of your projects can come from. Start looking at where we're expediting, start working at where we're doing late orders, start working at looking at where we have overtime and extra shifts because we're, our system isn't able to get the work done on time and then start to understand what's holding it up. And I think two out of three times at least, you'll find information is part of what's holding that job up. And the cost of getting information to actually speed up the cycle uh, can produce tens of thousand dollars a minute at virtually no cost. And then finally, uh, I'd like to end this concept with a tremendous quote from uh, Jack Welch who says, the rate of change on the outside, uh, if the rate of change on the outside of your organization, the external environment exceeds the rate of change on the inside, the end for your company is near. So what we're really trying to do is buy time as we're showing uh, in this graph and if we're buying time that the customer notices, we will be able to show that in a key metric. And right now, under these conditions, we have no other choice. But if we do it properly, we're actually gonna end up better on the other side. So uh, how do we actually go and buy time? Well, uh, thanks to the work of Colonel John Boyd, who was a US uh, Air Force Colonel, who studied uh, fighter jets, he actually broke down response time into these four steps, right? And they are first, observe. What's changed in the environment? Second, orient. Uh, what does this mean to our current state? 
How do we filter the information and how do we interpret it? Three is decide. How do we realign, realign ourselves to this new world based on our observation and orientation and then act? Once we've done the first three steps, how do we find and select the best action to take? And this is a great point to bring up uh, uh, failure number one. So the number one failure I see in buying technology is that buying the technology is a lot more fun than actually making it work. And I've had the opportunity uh, actually through MIT uh, Sloan Executive Education to do a joint program with F1. And uh, one thing uh, uh, I've learned from racing as well as many uh, projects I've worked on in industry is buying new technology like a, uh, a shiny new engine or a, a faster computer or a, a new drill press is a lot more fun than working with the pit crew and getting seconds there, right? But it turns out uh, you will get much more out of your investment if you spend a second or two in the early phases of observation and orientation than you will spending money on uh, uh, things that give you greater power to act like engines and uh, new machinery. So this leads us to where is it best for us to go in our own companies and buy time. And many of you may have heard of this concept referred to as pilot purgatory. It's McKinsey's term for the inability to scale industry 4.0 technology. And uh, recent findings from LNS research here in Cambridge uh, finds that there are two types of initiatives that are currently having greater impact when we do pilots. And let's look at what those are. So if you look in the, uh, on the left side of the graph on strategic initiatives, you will see uh, uh, things like we can work on customer experience, we can work on connected supply chain and operations, or we can also focus on connected workers, products and assets. And what this graph shows in the upper left uh, corner is, is the sweet spot where you get high value for your impact at low levels of effort. And you'll notice that the, the uh, two strategic initiatives that led the best pilots were around uh, uh, connected workers and connected assets. And why is that? It's because this is the part of the system that's under our own control. So it's not surprising that these provided the fastest uh, pathway to seeing a benefit out of a pilot. Now that doesn't mean we shouldn't work outside of our own organization, start reaching into the customer experience and into the supply chain. It's just saying we should uh, start fixing our own house first uh, before we start expanding these pilots out to the rest of the supply chain. Okay, and now uh, I'd like to take our second poll and find out what pilots you're doing in your own companies. So what is your current company status on Industry 4 pilots? And we'll pull up a poll and it's, we're not running any. We've got some in product progress or we're completed and we're stuck in purgatory. Okay, um, so uh, we have the results of the poll and uh, this is uh, not surprising to me and very typical. We have some in progress uh, and we're still waiting for results. So that means uh, when we see the results, until we see the results, we can't scale them. So uh, again, one of the critical factors is, did we actually pick the right uh, pilots to do? And are they still the right pilots given this current pandemic? And um, one of the uh, major challenges of ever uh, bringing across change management is the company's own culture. And one of the things I've learned over my past 20 years of uh, working in operations is I'm really concerned about time and response time, as you've seen in the previous uh, slides. My challenge is, is time is actually very connected into the way that company does work and its own culture. And I actually uh, uh, benefited from looking at uh, historical work, including John Boyd's. And I actually realized that when you look at a company's culture, you can actually look at it in the way they work their way through the OODA loop. And uh, what I'm showing on the left is the resources and time we spend as companies in which step of the OODA loop. 
So what I've noticed many companies is we don't spend enough time in uh, observing what the actual situation is or actually uh, uh, thoughtfully orienting ourselves around what we see. And we spent most of our times in um, offices and at whiteboards and on conference calls trying to make a decision and figure out what we need to do. And I uh, like to say that we're actually speculating when we should be observing. And then uh, after we go through that long decision step, uh, we then take action. And then because we didn't do the first two steps very well, we go into two more steps. So we went from do to act, and then we go to redo and to react. Now, where we need to go in the future is not only do we need to respond more quickly, we need to make better decisions. So uh, our, where we need to start allocating our time is more time in observe and orientation. And at that point, uh, if we do better observation orientation, we have the right data and information. So making decisions becomes uh, uh, not only higher quality, but becomes uh, uh, much quicker because uh, we actually have the right information and we're not studying uh, scenarios that actually aren't gonna happen. And then we can take the right action. And why is this? Well, it turns out uh, observation and orientation are actually pretty difficult steps. You have to go see the work, you have to talk to many people, and you have to get very inquisitive to see what's really going on. Now, this is a place where uh, Industry 4.0 and technology can really help because with this new waves of low cost sensors, visualization tools, and real time learning, um, we can have observation in minutes that used to uh, take hours, days, or weeks when we had to travel out to that site. And many of us are experiencing this now through things like Zoom conference, where we would wait a week or two to schedule a meeting to get people to travel, to schedule a room. Now all that's gone and uh, we've eliminated uh, a lot of the non-value added steps and we're spending more time in observation and orientation. So now to your company. Um, where is your company's biggest opportunity to buy time? And we're gonna put up a poll and is it in the observe step, the orient step or decide or act? Okay, and we have the results of the poll up and we'll, uh, we're actually relatively evenly dispersed uh, with uh, uh, about a quarter saying observe and orient, and then another third is in 27%, uh, 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 and uh, we have about act around 19%. So uh, fortunately, some of the most uh, um, cost effective and immediately applicable technologies from Industry 4.0 actually are in the first two steps. Okay, so now, We've looked at the systems, we've looked at the uh, challenges of uh, trying to buy uh, time to respond. Let's actually start to look at the industry 4.0 technologies we can use to help us with this. And um, if you look at the graph on the left, these are the nine pillars of industry 4.0 um, as defined by BCG. And uh, they are uh, additive manufacturing, augmented reality, autonomous robots, big data, digital twins, internet of things. And those uh, six to me really correspond to things we can start immediately and do smaller pilots on. The next three, cloud computing, cybersecurity, and system integration are all extremely critical when we wanna take the advantages of the top six and scale them across an entire enterprise. So I'm just gonna focus on the first six and I'm gonna show you some examples. And uh, what I might recommend for your company is uh, following this talk, take your company or your team through this type of exercise. If you're trying to buy observation, for instance, perhaps uh, investing in augmented reality where we can do some remote sensing or have uh, camera links from operations to experts a, at corporate is the place to invest. So why don't we start to look through some of these technologies and how companies are using them to help us in this current crisis. Uh, our first example is actually an ILP Stex company named called Form Labs uh, here in the Cambridge Somerville area. And uh, they've actually been able to step up 
and print 1 million swabs per week. And they're able to do this uh, exceptionally quickly and they've been able to gain uh, news and attention from the New York Times uh, and NPR as well as many other major outlets. And uh, why this was exceptionally so happens is additive manufacturing gives us the ability to observe and act, which is highly leveraged in the fight against COVID-19. And the question you might want to ask yourself is what parts in your supply chain are in the shortest lead times and where could additive manufacturing help us act more quickly? Now let's uh, look at uh, augmented, real augmented reality. And I'd like to show an example from COVID-19 response is as we all know, the current crisis has restricted travel and access to work sites. And that's a tremendous problem for large global operations or anyone who works in a global supply chain because our typical behavior is go see the problem to travel to work. Now uh, our experts and uh, customers and suppliers in the supply chain are no longer allowed to visit many of these facilities or it's become very difficult. So therefore, uh, the first three steps of the OODA loop, especially observe, has become exceptionally difficult. And my tremendous concern here is uh, from working in the process industries is that's putting our facilities at great risk. Uh, many of you may have heard of the Flixborough accident uh, in, uh, in the United Kingdom in 1974, where a chemical uh, uh, plant exploded and killed uh, uh, 20 to 30 people in the town. And the root cause was the maintenance team drew up a new piping uh, arrangement on the floor on a Sunday when no one was at work and installed it on their own, right? That led to a major change in, in the uh, chemical industry in terms of safety. My fear is if we can't reach out and find experts that we may be getting these behaviors on the factory floor that lead to greater uh, risk. And if you look to the picture on the left, uh, companies like PTC, they're here in Boston, uh, essentially using uh, their software product in an iPad if you hold uh, that iPad up to the piece of equipment you're looking at and circle the parts you'd like to show, you can transmit that information to an expert anywhere in the world and they can help diagnose and talk you through the procedure so we make an informed decision based on all of our knowledge. Uh, next is uh, autonomous robots. <clears throat> uh, one of the things I think is going to change through this crisis and we're never going back to again is putting people in harm's way in uh, large facilities such as automotive and chemical plants. And uh, something we didn't have five years ago is clear uh, observability with GPS to know where people are at any time in the refinery. And we are putting people in high hazard areas and that's something uh, thanks to COVID-19, we're seeing our way out of it. Our example on the left is from Boston Dynamics. Uh, you can see they cleverly put an iPad on top of one of their robots. And now we can send these robots uh, into hospital rooms uh, with uh, patients with COVID-19, therefore collecting information, but protecting the doctors and nurses. And what uh, we're learning from this example, and we're also learning from Industry 4.0, is there's no reason to put a person in harm's way, especially when we're trying to do an observation. So my recommendation when you go back to your work sites, look for places where we have stringent PPE requirements uh, to go uh, do the work or do an observation and start to see if we can replace or redesign that work with one of these industry 4.0 technologies. Now big data. <clears throat> and this is a place where uh, MIT has really been uh, uh, very active in this area we formed a COVID-19 response team. And uh, what uh, the MIT team is doing is they're making the current state of the pandemic observable in real time. So if you look on the uh, uh, left side of the screen, you'll see uh, uh, essentially this dashboard they put together in you know, less than a week. And it's essentially providing you with real time data collected from multiple sources and then visually mapped geographically so now uh, anyone with access to the internet can see this information 
and use it to take action accordingly. And uh, without the uh, Industry 4.0 and this great industrial backbone, uh, doing this in real time at relatively no cost would not have been possible. And as interested as I am in what we see today, what I'm really interested is what capabilities this team is going to add to this uh, system next week. And that's the beauty of the flexibility of technology. It allows people to work agilely and uh, uh, adopt new learnings as we go. And our cycle times is going from months and years down to weeks and days. Now let's look at digital twins. Um, this is another example from an uh, a MIT ILP Stex company called Excelos. They're here in Cambridge. And let me tell you what uh, the problem they're trying to solve is the world is filled with uh, very expensive capital intensive assets that are, that are at or near uh, their design life cycle. But most of these assets actually have, uh, uh, could have their life extended. The problem is it's been difficult to actually uh, access the risk of the actual system. And what Excelos does is uh, they're able to run finite element analysis to simulate stresses on uh, major capital assets, such as including uh, in oil and gas, we hear uh, see a drill ship on the top, and they're also able to do it in wind farms. And uh, uh, through uh, bringing uh, ubiquitous sensor measurements from the field, and then running a digital twin uh, in terms of a stress analysis in under two seconds, they're able to uh, give uh, very precise predictions of the assets, stress curves, and life cycle in real time versus uh, assumptions that were made 25 years ago. And uh, this allows them to make faster decisions based on observations. And let me give you two quick examples. One, uh, and this is very relevant to wind farms, if you're seeing a, a storm with a certain amount of wind shear, that might end, uh, endanger the wind farm. But if it's coming at a, uh, a different angle than the wind farm's positioned, uh, they can do a quick analysis to say we can keep that farm running. And then second, they also had an issue where uh, the welds on a certain wind farm were not done as specified. They were able to, in real time, analyze those welds, uh, have them certified they're okay, and keep that field up and running, which could have actually led to weeks or months of downtime. Now I'd like to uh, look at advanced algorithms. And uh, the uh, easiest and opportunity to take advantage of advanced algorithms in this current crisis is around robotic process automation, or RPA. And here, uh, it's really about how people use uh, information and data. And have we actually designed these systems so that information uh, flows cleanly? So. I've recently performed several projects where uh, back office workers or those supporting customer uh, uh, response times, it took them 30 to 40 minutes to pull up the necessary information from three to five different databases, assemble it into a spreadsheet, and then actually analyze that data so that they were ready for their next sales call. And through actually, uh, uh, this is actually called Swivelware because the uh, uh, our, uh, frontline person is spending 80% of their time moving back and forth between applications rather than actually doing the work. And uh, not only can we simply test this using things like macros in Excel, there are also several companies in this space that actually uh, help you write these types of automated macros or bots in a way that's actually scalable for the organization. And um, it's not uncommon to reduce the time uh, frontline workers spend on these tasks by 80 to 90 percent, which then gives them more time to spend in front of the customer and answering their needs. We also have the Internet of Things, and what's amazing today is uh, we have the cost of sensors has fallen nearly to zero, and we can literally put a nervous system around the world. And I want to give you two examples of that. One is a company uh, called Machine Metrics. They're here in Massachusetts. It's a startup around 2014 or 2015. And they currently have uh, uptime sensors on several thousand pieces of, of uh, manufacturing equipment, much of it legacy. So not only can they tell you whether or not your machinery is up and running in real time, 
which I find to be a massive problem in, in uh, most machine shops I go into, they can actually aggregate this information. And on the left, you can actually see they are showing on a daily basis uh, uh, production on all these machines. This actually gives us leading indicators on what's going on in our supply chain. And as you can see in the blue curve, uh, COVID-19 shows that sharp drop near the end and you're starting to see some type of a recovery. And this is something uh, uh, the CEO, uh, Bill Bither and his teams at uh, Machine Metrics updates every day. We can also look at the COVID-19. This is a, a very interesting example from Kinza. Uh, they basically uh, taken a thermometer and hooked it up to Bluetooth so they can, uh, we can actually aggregate in real time what people's temperatures are. Now, when he started this, when that company was founded, probably wasn't founded on the basis of COVID-19, but now we're getting real time uh, data of the hotspots uh, in our country where we're seeing uh, fevers and temperatures, and that can actually start to influence some of our policy of where we need to add more resources and where we can think about going back to work. And again, I wanted really to focus on the first uh, top six um, uh, pillars of Industry 4.0, but just a quick note on the last three, platform, system, integration, and security. And I like to show this graph on the left. That is the photograph of a telephone pole uh, in Pratt, Kansas in 1911. And the problem was back then, uh, if I, I needed a connection to any person I wanted to talk to. Now, of course, we all know uh, how that got fixed is we use uh, uh, basically uh, localized switching, which is of course a platform. So the message here is, as you start to uh, get some of these interesting pilots and you're like, let's scale this, we are going to need a pilot. So I'll leave this with a Starbucks example. You want to get the specs for the cup of coffee right before you open 10,000 shops. So pilots are important, but once the pilots start to show success, you need to have start to think about your platform strategy. And the key for you is you go back, how do we select the right platform that not only helps us get out of this crisis, but it actually propagates our recovery into the future so that we don't go back to back to normal behavior. And right now, I'd like to just take a poll on the most important technology. Which pillar technology do you think your company should focus on next? And let me give you a little time for that poll. Okay, um, we have our results. And um, uh, I don't think this is surprising that uh, the big uh, indications are big data and uh, uh, internet of things. And both of those are around the observe step, right? And what I do find amazing is uh, our technology is actually outstripped our ability to observe uh, both from collection data and then analyzing it. And this is going to be the real revolution of Industry 4.0. So I think that's a great example of uh, uh, where we need to focus our technology. And obviously, if we observe better, it actually has a very positive knock-on effect on the following steps in the OODA loop. It's also going to help us uh, anticipate the recovery and lead us into the new future. And uh, finally, uh, I'd like to end with a, a few takeaways. So first is, um, when I do uh, change orders, I'm often asked to come in, let's, let's digitize the company, um, let's, let's bring in Industry 4.0. And uh, one recent company I came to, uh, the first thing I saw before I even came into the company was a religious statue in the parking lot surrounded by cigarette butts. And I say, I don't think we want to digitize that. So as we go to digitize our organizations and move into Industry 4.0, we are going to have to remove the artifacts of what's already there. And this is a great uh, formula for behavior by Kurt Lewin, who founded the uh, Center for Group Dynamics at MIT back in, uh, right after World War II. And he said, behavior is a function of the people and the system with which they find themselves in. And wouldn't it be great if we could just shove technology in, right? And that would fix everything. That'd be great, but uh, my experience is, is that's not what happens. What happens is um, it's very similar to the human body. 
if I want to replace a, a failing organ in your body with a, a, a new heart, um, the body often rejects it, even though it may die. And so what we really need to do is understand how the people in the system are using their current technologies so we can break it down into uh, pieces and then let the people adopt it and change their own system. And uh, a last quote from uh, 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 Kurt Lewin is, if you really want to try to understand a system, just try and change it. And so uh, three takeaways is this current pandemic has opened up the need and the opportunity to adopt new technologies. If we do it incorrectly, the system's current immune system will reject company saving technologies. So success depends on your company's ability to adopt and incorporate the technology in small sequence cycles in your existing system. And that's really where I spend uh, most of the time with my companies and in my course is the values really in the diagnosis. And uh, you can see this uh, uh, photograph, and I hope most of you can uh, recognize that's uh, uh, Thomas Edison on the left, and uh, the gentleman on the right is uh, a gentleman by the name of Charles Steinmetz. And I'm gonna tell you a little story. There was an, uh, an engineer was asked to come and fix a plant. They were having trouble with their generators and electrical systems. And it was plaguing the facility for months, and they couldn't solve it, right? And they brought in this engineer, and the engineer sat for half a day, made a white chalk mark on a flange on one of the uh, uh, generators. And uh, when the team opened that up, they found the problem. So in half a day, he was able to diagnose the problem. They fixed it. The plant was up and running. Then uh, this engineer gave the plant manager a bill for $10,000, which the plant manager said, well, you're only there uh, half a day. I want an itemized bill. So um, that engineer did give the itemized bill and it uh, looked like this. The invoice was for $10,000, a dollar for a piece of chalk and $9,999 of knowing where to draw the X. And many of you may have heard that story. It turns out it's actually true. The man who did it is on the right is Charles Steinmetz and the plant manager turned out to be Henry Ford. So with that, I'd like to open it up to questions. And of course, thank you. And you can contact me through email. You can look at my course or also look at me at LinkedIn. So thanks and I'd like to open up for questions. Thank you very much, John. Uh, here comes uh, the first question. Uh, in the previous uh, uh, talk, somebody asked about the uh, digital transformation for uh, in the government sector. Here, uh, the question is how uh, digital transformation can uh, best help the traditional manufacturer sector. Uh, like, uh, for example, how they can leverage uh, the digital digital technologies and methodologies to recover from uh, uh, quickly from recover quickly from disruptions, both from uh, their supply chain or the manufacturer line. Okay, so uh, first, I'm going to start with this is a great question, and the first uh, uh, place I'd like to start with was inside an organization. I study something called hidden factories, which was actually came out of the Sloan School in the 50s. And uh, what I find is when I go into most companies, especially manufacturing, about a third of the work that's going on in that factory, um, it's not scheduled, um, it's, it's half completed, I'm not sure who's actually supposed to be working on it, and it's to fix a defect that shouldn't have happened in the first place. And so what happens is, I start to build up this, a third of the factories actually dealing with defects and little problems we never fixed. And then my planning and scheduling falls apart. So where industry 4.0 can help is it actually lets you see the actual state of your system and what's going on, right? And uh, 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 two examples, one is um, my, uh, my thesis student uh, for the MIT LGO program. Uh, he did an industry 4.0 project and uh, the major output was they now know when their top four pieces of equipment are running, right? And you'd think that companies know that. It was actually shutting down for 45 seconds every five or 10 minutes. So it went over the corporate radar, but it actually showed up in uh, 
time delays, right? So I think your first place uh, for industry 4.0 is actually understanding the current state of your system um, and actually looking for uh, where I've, my equipment has stopped and it's waiting. Uh, and I'm also gonna see defects I've never seen before. Um, in terms of moving into your supply chain, uh, in the past, it took up to 18 months to qualify a new supplier. And uh, I always use the example in, uh, if I buy one of your products, I just buy your product. But if I'm buying 10,000 units, I'm buying your process. So what I really wanna know is your control chart. So where I'm seeing uh, companies move forward is they're actually able to look into the control charts of their suppliers so they can see what they're producing at and, and at what quality so they're not getting any shock from coming upstream. And also, uh, as you saw from Bill Bither's example from Machine Metrics, you can see your customer's production downstream, which is actually a leading indicator of customer pull. So those would be the first two places I would start with Industry 4.0. Thank you. Uh, here comes another question. It's an interesting question. Do you envision a future with digital biological twins in the medical pharma industry based on the advancement in genetics. Okay, so let, let me uh, give an example. Let's, let's just say I, um, I have some chronic disease to my liver, okay, which, and I also means I have to take some uh, pharmaceutical on a regular basis for the rest of my life, right? I think what you're referring to is if they could take some of my liver cells and grow them, and then they would basically simulate how my liver was performing over time, right? With my cells and my genetics, that might give an early indication that, uh, so if I see a problem in that digital twin of those liver cells, it might also indicate a problem with the drug I'm taking internally and that my dose might be adjusted. So if you're talking that type of digital twin, um, I would not be surprised to start seeing that. I also think, we're starting to see digital twins for how, how our hearts behave, right? Because we're all on these uh, real-time monitors. Now um, there's been a lot of exciting work on you know, uh, hearts and the uh, stimulant cells for that. Wouldn't be surprised to see some of that as well. It, but that, that's a little farther off, but any place where you can build a twin, whether it's digital, biological, or even out of physical uh, uh, parts, like a, a physical uh, demo, it's well worth your investment. Thank you. Uh, that certainly is the area uh, <coughs> to be explored uh, further. Uh, next question is, how can we improve the decision-making process? Organizational changes, technology, or technology? Okay, and uh, you know, I'm gonna speak from my practical experience is um, decision-making becomes very cultural in a company. And, uh, what I find has been the most effective way in uh, changing the way we do decision making is to bring the right information. And like I said previously in the talk, uh, we're, we're actually doing speculation when we should be doing observation. So whenever we get into a scenario in a meeting where we're in of doing a bunch of what ifs and what if this, what if that, why don't we just go on and look? right? I've been doing this for 20 years. The advantage is now if, uh, if the plant's 50 miles away, we can get on the phone and say, hey, can you take the camera out and uh, give us a real video feed of what's going on in that machine? So my number one answer here is strengthen your observe muscle, right? The second step is, uh, here's a funny thing about information. When we see information we don't like, we like to filter it out, right? So then the second step is uh, think about when we bring in new information, uh, are we actually using our cultural filters to reject it or are we actually using it uh, to make good decisions? Thank you. Uh, next question is regarding a uh, platform model. Um, so there's uh, always a, a missing part in better observation to determine how and if to go about implementing a platform. And this actually was an issue of company culture uh, as leadership was pushing a platform while the rank and the file were puzzled 
by this decision? How can this situation be turned around when leadership is not paying attention to input from those on the front lines? Culturally related. <laughs> so this is the eternal question of working in manufacturing and operations. And first, I just, uh, I, I spend most of my time on the floor, not with the CEO levels, although I do spend some time there. And, but I want to say, you know, the perspective from the CEO's level or that corporate suite is, especially for large companies, there's a lot of external pressures for them to invest in a platform and say we have it, right? So from their board of directors, uh, from their competitors are doing it. Um, and it's just, you know, my, uh, my competitor has the newest technology, so we have to have it too. The only way to really do this is you've got to get uh, the CEO down in the factories and get people's perspective. And if you do that, you'll make a much better decision on the platform that you select. Um, the challenge is, and I do a lot of this with companies, is uh, some uh, in companies where leadership's not used to spending time on the floor, um, this is a huge hurdle, right? So, uh, but I think there's no simple answer than somehow, uh, you know, bringing some of the leadership down on the floor and see the real problems. And for that, you need to find someone in the organization that both has experience with the front line and has connections to senior management to lead that. So you've got to find that person. And if the company's large enough, they're always there. Thank you so much, uh, Stephanie and John, for the excellent talks. I know you can get much deeper and broader if there is more time. Hi, everyone. I hope you found these talks inspiring and relevant. And thank you for your attention and participation. Uh, this concludes our session today. There will be a short survey when you leave this webinar session. Please complete the, uh, the survey. Your feedback is greatly appreciated. The next session will take place on next Tuesday. May the 26th. Until then, stay safe and healthy, and I'll see you on the next session. Goodbye.